Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to the program. Saturday morning and we have some very sublime subjects that we're covering this morning. We're going to be looking at art and the Linasia Art Expo people will be here to not only showcase their art but talk about their love of art and why it's important that we embrace art in our lives. But first up, uh, Rosh Gold Young Business Achiever Awards is around the corner. It's going to happen all early in the new year but that also means if you're a young entrepreneur you still have time to enter this amazing competition. It's done wonders for past participants. They are truly movers and shakers in our community now. And they make us proud, don't they? They make us absolutely proud. And we need to go out in our droves to support them, support their businesses, support their initiatives, and just give them the motivation to carry on. So in studio with me today is Shakira Rahiman Sali. She is from uh, Rosh Gold. And we have one of the participants uh, who will be in the studio with us for the first part of the show. He is Mohammed Tahir Khan. He is a first runner up uh, 2018. And we'll have the next runner up in a short while. We'll also try and hook up via Skype to our third person, Yusuf Umar. Hashtag our stories is what his enterprise is called. Shankira, assalamu alaikum. Welcome to, pro to the program. Wa alaikum salam. Thank you so much for having us again, Julie. It's, it's great. You know what? I <laughs> attended. Over the years, Uncle Harun always invited me to the functions and I never could attend because it always clashed with other social engagements. And for the first time, I I attended last year and I was blown away. The standard of the actual function and the standard of the participants, the entrance, uh, was absolutely amazing and made me proud to see this type of talent, alhamdulillah, in our community and an organization like Rosh Gold that's bringing it to the floor um, and to the fore for that matter. So tell us your role with Rosh Gold. You've been with them for a while. Yes, yes, I have. Um, and thank you so much for your positive feedback and compliments. I mean, I'm blown away being part of this competition when we meet people in businesses like Mohammed Tahir. You mentioned Yusuf Umar, who's our winner. You'll also hear from Safia Esakji, who will be on in a bit. We're really, really so proud to support our young businesses. And my role, uh, Julie, I've been with Rosh Gold for over 11 years wow. now. And Alhamdulillah, I am the spokesperson for the Young Business Achiever Awards. Um, and I'm also the project coordinator for this competition. So I work very much with every single entry that comes in. Um, and I'm so inspired, like I say, by them. And what's more important, I feel, to acknowledge for the, the reason why we launched these awards, um, it was founded by the uh, current CEO of Rosh Gold, as you mentioned, Mr. Harun Pochi, uh, in 2017. So it's our third annual competition this year. It grows every year. Uh, and we support by sponsors such as Al Baraka South Africa and Oko of South Africa and a whole range of organizations. There's so many hands that make this competition what it is. And Alhamdulillah, he had the foresight to see this is a way of uplifting the youth. And I should imagine even older people that are starting out for the first time or have something to add to uplift and showcase our community for what it, you know, for what it really is. And there is an abundance, Alhamdulillah of talent yes. um, and resources that we ought to, to truly showcase and show to the world what we're all about as a Muslim community right here in South Africa. 100% spot on, Julie. And, you know, when you speak of South Africa, this competition has grown so much. We operate on a national scale where we 
actually go to the various business hubs. We've been to uh, Johannesburg in Kilani and in Lanesia. Uh, we were hosted by Albarica both in Durban and Cape Town. And we've just come back from Pretoria now in Erasmia. And these are the communities that we actually go to and we hear every story, you know, every entrepreneur has a story why they started, where they're currently at and where they have to go. And I think on a bigger objective, what we want to do is um, be part of the solution to the unemployment crisis Absolutely. in our country. Um, the statistics are both arresting Horrendous. and alarming. <laughs> yeah. And it is, uh, according to status, I am subject to correction on the most current figures, but the youth are amongst the most affected by this crisis. In, uh, it's at 29.1 percent. It's shocking. Yes. 100%. Unemployment. We're talking unemployment rate. Yes. Shankira, let me talk to Mohammed Tahir Khan, who is the first runner-up of the Young Business, um, the YBAA 2018. Um, you, as welcome to the program. Wa alaikum salam. You are a, an engineer by profession. That's right. I presume at some point in your life you were employed by Corporate South Africa, one of the big corporates. Why did you decide to become an entrepreneur and how long are you in your own little business? <coughs> That's right, Julie. So I started off as an electrical engineer with Cecil, a large um, you know, en energy company in South Africa. And I spent five years there, uh, which I would recommend for anyone you know, who is coming out of um, university with a degree. You know, start with a corporate, learn the ropes, <clears throat> get the experience, and then look at opportunities to you know, go out on your own. Uh, so I spent four to five years with them, <clears throat> and I was involved in the energy space, and I continued um, for a few other employees, employers after that in renewable energy, in the power sector, until I reached a point where I thought, you know, I have learned a lot. I do know the industry well. I have the networks. And, you know, it, I don't want to look back at some point in my life and regret not trying to do something on my own. So together with uh, my co-director in the company, who was a friend of mine at university, also an electrical engineer, we co-founded Zero Point Energy in 2015. And the focus was on sustainable energy, you know, looking at opportunities and how we can assist uh, industrial, commercial, even residential customers to reduce their energy expenditure, to reduce the pressure that they put on the electricity sector, you know, to be as sustainable and as self-sufficient as possible. And uh, I mean, we explore everything from solar PV, uh, battery storage, uh, efficient lighting, efficient water, and all these uh, related type of technologies that are, um, you know, geared towards sustainable living. But it's a tough market to be in. You're competing with possibly big names. And it must have been quite a leap of faith for you to leave a cushy corporate job to start out on your own. How concerned were you about that? And what is the being a runner up uh, with the Young Business Achievers Awards done for you and your business? And did you think mm. that it was a space you wanted to occupy. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's not an easy decision by, by any means. That is to and change jobs. To, yeah. to change jobs, yeah. to leave a corporate uh, cushy uh, career, like you say. But I think what we did slightly differently was uh, we set up the company um, knowing full well that uh, we weren't going to go full time into it initially. Ah. And we looked at subcontracting contractors and subcontracting consul um, sub so consultant engineers. So creating more opportunities Absolutely. for other people. That's right. And slowly we built up the credibility and we built up the resource and the capability up to the point where I realized that to take this thing further, you needed to jump in with two legs or you, know, yeah. you can't keep sitting on the fence. Right. And then, uh, alhamdulillah, in 2015, I, I made that decision. And um, you know, from then, we've just continued to grow. And it's not easy being a startup um, energy in the energy space. But uh, definitely, you know, just knowing people in the industry, the networks, um, finding the right clientele, and just doing um, and offering a service that you're proud of, that you know is you're giving it your best quality, I think that also attracts clientele. So you asked, how do we compete with the larger entities? And are you um, competitive enough? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I, 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 would, I would definitely agree or uh -huh. um, say that we are competitive. Uh, you know, when you're a small entity competing with big industrial players, you can't compete necessarily on um, track record to the same level, but you have to uh, gain the confidence of your customers, provide that added 
a special value in terms of your service offering, in terms of your personal personalization. And so you give it that personal trust. touch. A absolutely. And uh -huh. the, your turnaround times and the customization and all those things that you won't necessarily get from a large organization. And that has put us in good stead, you know, in the work that we've done with indust large industrial companies, uh, larger renewable energy developers. You know, we've gained that confidence. And alhamdulillah, we are at a point now where we have a good track record of large clients, um, you know, that shows that they have confidence in us. Okay, we're mm. almost coming to the end of this part of the interview. What is YBAA being an entrant to First Round Up? What has it done for you as a person and your company? So I think definitely the, the application process alone um, was really good, you know, in the sense that it almost forced you to, if you hadn't given thought to your business uh, plan or to you or structuring your business, uh, the way that they ask the questions in the questionnaire you needed to fill out. That alone um, gave a lot of insight into uh, the company and to ourselves as entrepreneurs. So I think I give a lot of credit to Roche Call for the way that they um, you know, presented the application process. But secondly, um, throughout the process and having um, attended the, the finals, I think the level of networking with like-minded entrepreneurs, but also networking with Roche Gold itself and the judging panel and you know all their affiliates, and the sponsors as well. That just created a much larger sense of uh, business family within the community that uh, I think you have to give a lot of credit to Roche Gold and the sponsors for. And uh, I mean, since then, I've stayed, I stayed in touch with a lot of the, um, uh, you know, my fellow entrepreneurs who enter the competition, as well as Roche Gold, as well as some of the judges and the sponsors. And it just created a, a, a new uh, extended network for us. And then also being, um, one of the finalists, I think the, the prizes were really good as well. What did uh, you win? <laughs> so there, there, there's quite a few that we can talk through, but I mean, they were... The main um, one, because we don't have much time. <clears throat> so there was prize money that they uh -huh. gave us to inject into the business, wow. which really assisted. And then there were smaller prizes as well that the, some of the sponsors brought to the table. But I think the exposure alone in itself was extremely invaluable. And I should imagine just being recognised. Absolutely. Um, and that, like you it. said, mm. being recognised and the networking uh, mm. platform that it allows you. And even if you don't get business from that networking circle of yours, mm. just being part of now Rosh, that Rosh Gold family allows for so much future growth and development. Absolutely. I mean, the next time somebody in, the, in that circle is looking for renewable energy or sustainable engineering, I know without a doubt that they're going to think, hey, let's contact Mom and Thayet, yeah, or put us in contact at least. And you know, the, the marketing and the branding that has come out of it as well alone is, you know, you kind of attach a value to that. So I think that that has really been good. And, um, and on the subject, if I may, on the invaluable, besides the marketing and the promotion, the mentoring and coaching as well that you receive one-on-one, right. on one, you know, entrepreneurs don't always have access to those resources. Absolutely. So I don't know if you, like, with that And that, that comes at a huge price as yes. well. Yes. So there, there has been monthly business coaching as, as winners that we received uh, over the course of the year. That was quite valuable. And then there were life coaching sessions as well. So I think all of that together. Is Finally, mm. what are you putting back into Rosh Gold? <clears throat> so at the moment, we are in contact with uh, Uncle uh, Pochi mm -hmm. um, from Rosh Gold. We are looking at financing opportunities for projects that we have. Sorry, you're not feeling too well. <laughs> I know that you've got uh, the flu, but may go off you. We are going for an ad break, inshallah. There you have it, the first runner-up from last year's YBBA, yes, YBAA 2018 Young Business Entrepreneurs Awards, which Rush Gold has been showcasing for the past three years. And we leave Mohammed Tahir Khan there to recover, we're going to be joined by another contestant on the show. And I just think this is amazing stuff. And how encouraging that Rosh Gold is uplifting our community. Alhamdulillah. Welcome back. We're talking to the Rosh Gold Young Business Entrepreneurs um, Awards contestants. We also have Shakira Rahiman Sali from uh, Rosh Gold in studio with us. Uh, Mohammed was absolutely amazing, and no doubt his um, business will grow from strength to strength, inshallah. as with all of the contestants, past, present, and inshallah future as well. Amen. 
um, we have another amazing lady here. She is Safia Esadji, a past and a present contestant. Um, why? Uh, what is it that's drawing you back again and again? Tell us about your past venture and then we'll talk the cu current venture, which is Utiyala. Brilliant. Tell us about it. Thank you and assalamu alaikum. So really, you know, as every entrepreneur, uh, we're always looking for that extra cash injection. And so <laughs> the YBA came out. And really, I think that's the drawing factor. There's these amazing prizes. Um, and so that's where we started really as a participant uh, under the name of AEGM Solutions, which is um, an engineering solutions company. Uh, and that's and, your husband. And that's my he husband. He heads it. He heads it. So okay. he's the mechanical engineer with the MBA. And so, and that's his entrepreneurial leg of, you know, of his career development. Um, and so we entered it. Um, what I can say is just, you know, entering the nomination form and what, what attracted us to it is then reflecting on your business as you go through this nomination form. As entrepreneurs, rather young entrepreneurs, you're often so busy in operations that you forget to just sit back a little bit with a bird's eye view of saying, am I aligned to my strategy? Um, you know, you're just trying to chase money, keep operations up, get yourself that, you know, continuous um, targets and sales targets. And that uh, entry form allows you to look at your business uh, with new eyes, does it not? Because Definitely. it answers a lot of questions that may have been at the back of your mind, but you never really listened to it. So there's something like, you know, you're going back, Roshko asked you a question about your financial status, and it makes you sit back and say, what did I put into this? Um, what did I achieve? What was my return on investment? And really go back and reflect as to, like I said, aligning your strategy. What are your future goals? How are you making an impact? And so the form itself grounds you, you know, again, as to why I, am I an entrepreneur? Entrepreneurs for me are, I like to use the word gapologist. It's always about the passion. And um, for us, what Roshkal does in the YBAA is to promote and recognize the passion you as an individual have. So that is amazing in itself. And so last year, you were an entrant because you, in the business with your husband, you were a chartered accountant by profession. Uh, where did you feature last year? Sure. So a bit of backstory of myself is uh, I'm a chartered accountant with uh, experience in you know, private industry, in top four, uh, big four audit firms. Um, I had my third child and I decided to take a step back. Um, also, we, we have this commitment for lifelong learning. You know, so my husband was doing now his second master's and I thought it's the right time to step back. But I also realized while he's pursuing his career, I have all this knowledge that I can share and contribute to his. And so I, I, I self-proclaimed uh, a business development manager as AGM and assisted you know, with the skill set that I had and contributed to his company. Um, and so we went through the entire competition. Alhamdulillah, we were nominated as a top 28. Wow. Um, so, you know, at the end, I, we did not win in any category. Uh, top 28 was a major achievement and for us. And it's not necessarily about the winning. Mm -hmm. I think just the entering and being in a room full of like-minded people, that in itself is an achievement. But let's hold that thought, we'll be back with you in a minute or two. Amazing people talking to us on this Saturday morning makes me kind of wonder, where do I go to from here next? Because you, you can't stop learning, you can't stop expanding and growing your mind, because if you do, you might as well just curl up in a corner and die. Assalamu alaikum, welcome to the program. Yusuf Umar from Hashtag Our Stories, who is the third contestant, I think, or one of the contestants on the YBAA Awards. Yusuf, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. I, I don't think I've ever spoken on the show before, so it's a privilege. Yeah, tell us about um, our stories. I believe you're doing amazing work with uh, your style of journalism. Thank you so much. We train communities all over the world how to tell stories using mobile phones and even using wearable technology. I mean, right now I'm wearing a camera on my face. I press that button and I'm recording video right now. So we train communities all over the world how to tell stories with these technologies. And we curate that content into shows. We produce a show every day, a little bit like how I'm on your show right now. And our show reaches millions and millions of people. And it's generally focused on people that are changing their world. Innovators, change makers, unsung heroes. To enter this competition. 
Yeah, I mean, working with Rush Gold has been an amazing opportunity. We have gained access to uh, meeting new people and really accessing new audiences and engaging with communities across South Africa. It was really, uh, for us at least, about connecting with other startups, other up-and-coming um, people that are doing amazing things, trying to do social good, trying to change the world in their own way. Uh, and I think that we are stronger together than we are apart. So the ability to work with other startups has been an incredible opportunity. People watching us this morning and who don't know or understand the type of space you're in and the type of work you're doing. And we know that um, the world is changing. Tech. We can't even keep up with technology. But you're one of the bright sparks that has jumped on board. Just share this information with other people watching us this morning and what possibly, how amazing the future looks as far as technology is concerned. Yeah, I think the future of technology is incredibly exciting and, and liberating. I mean, of course, we've seen the risks of technology too, right? With the democratization of media and anyone able to tell a story, it has led to some forms of false information that is spread around, and, and, and especially here in South Africa, we're no strangers to the kind of rumor mill that, that goes across WhatsApp and these kinds of platforms. But having said that, the access to uh, 3G, 4G, 5G internet is really enabling South Africans to enter the digital economy, to be able to sell products with the world, to be able to engage with education, we are seeing a landscape where over the next 10 years or so, we can expect to see no textbooks left in our schools, where everything will be engaged through uh, tablets and these kinds of technologies. Over the next 10 to 15 years, we can expect to see a landscape where you won't have any mobile phones left in the world, where people will engage with technology using wearable technology like this, where you'll have information in your periphery. Uh, you spoke earlier in your last segment, I think you, you, you said you'd, you'd, uh, people are better off rolling up and dying than they are not educating themselves. And I think we now have access to more education than ever before. That's where we leave it. Thank you indeed for being with us. Good luck on uh, being an entrant. Let's uh, swap over to Sharkida and maybe she can share some more information about the other type of entrance on the uh, YBAA 2019. You people, Rosh Gold has extended the closing date for the entries. Why? Yes, that's correct, actually. So the initial uh, closing date was the 30th of October. We've extended it to the 7th to accommodate more entries on a national scale and also to do our regional launches. We've just come back from Pretoria and we're just asking all the entrepreneurs who are watching young businesses, dynamic individuals, just like Yusuf Umar, who was our winner last year, just like Mohamed Tahir Khan, who was our first runner-up, and Safiya as well, who's entered her business. And inshallah, we wish her all the best and all the applic applicants all the best. We had 80 uh, entrants to date and counting, and we're hoping to get more dynamic individuals to give them the opportunity to promote, to recognize, reward, and promote them. And I just want to say... Uh, Julie, and they must be very diverse. Yes, very diverse. Bring your set of skills to the table. Yusuf is very strong in technology. Um, Mohamed retired in greener energy. Sophia, uh, she told you a bit about her business as well in terms of um, the, the people that she influences, the students that she influences. There are so many different dynamic businesses. Bring what is your skill set to the table and we look to empower you and reward you for that. I just want to say the prizes are phenomenal. Okay, hold that. Right. I just want to go to Sophia for a minute. Sophia, you're here to talk, while well, you were supposed to have been here to talk about um, being a current entrant as well and that is is a business that is called, can just remind me? So it's Utiala STEM Institute. All right. I actually don't want to compromise on the interview. I think you have so much of value to talk to us about that. Can we invite you to join us on our show next week, inshallah? And if your husband's able to join sure. as well, you guys can come in and let's really do an in-depth interview. Sure. We'll be so we look forward to seeing you Great. then where you awesome. can talk in detail about Utiala. Back to you, Shakira. Talk to us about prizes, number one, and all the, a few of the current entrants that have blown you away. 
Okay, um, uh, so the prizes are phenomenal. We have over 500,000 rand with, uh, with total prizes, <laughs> of which 100,000 alone are the cash injections, cash prizes, upgrades to technology. Um, we have an Apple iWatch, Apple iPads, the latest i7 laptop worth 20,000 rand, mentoring and coaching we spoke about, promotion, excellent. Every business that's confirmed gets promoted on our network. And this year we also have a really nice prize for the winner being a trip to Turkey Ooh. sponsored by Broadway <laughs> Suites. Can't I enter? <laughs> <laughs> yes, that is a really sweet prize to, right. to get, actually. And, um, you know, I, I can't single Just out... Just give me... You know, I, I know it's very yes. difficult because, you know, uh, we can't... Um, we don't want people to think that we're creating favoritism or yes. anything, but just the diversity of the entrance. You know, how diverse does the situ you know the, the entrance look like? So, some entrance that I can think of offhand. Um, there's I Daphne in Durban. Um, Doing her, what? She's a, uh, her name is Nomfundo uh, Guala, and she has nannies to help with parents, wow. and she's built this business around that, um, adding value to a very busy parent's life. And I think that's a very nice thing for me. As a parent to, to know that that's accessible to me. Um, we also have a lady who uh, is creating toys for um, a, a special needs children and she mm -hmm. does this, it's locally produced and she has the knowledge to do that and, and this was just something that sparked recently. We have uh, home industries, I know a lot of um, the audience, uh, the, the viewers that are watching, mm -hmm. it's as simple as baking pre-mixes. Mesmerizing mixes mes comes to, that's that's exactly, to mind exactly when you speak. That's exactly who I'm talking about and Sadia has entered for the past two to three, I think this would be her third year running um, and her idea really sparked off by her sister who was traveling a little for, I think in Cape Town, she was uh, studying there and she wanted nice homemade biscuits. So Sadia came up with this ingenious idea of creating these premixes and that's, it's just grown. She's invested in a website last year from the prize money that she got from Rosh Sun uh, and, and it's really, really built an online present. So this is something that we look forward to. You can re-enter like uh, Sophia and Sadia uh, as long as you're not in the top five. All right, brilliant. What's the, um, you know, what's the advantage of re-entering, even if you don't make the top 28 for that matter? Just explain to our viewers the value in re-entering all the time. You know, and you're not going to exclude anybody from no, re-entering. As long as you meet the criteria, which is you need to be between the ages of 18 to 37 years old, you need to be in business and you need to reside within South Africa. I'd encourage all the viewers to go to the website to see the full terms and conditions, but those are the main criteria. We will not exclude you. You should be a confirmed participant once the, once the competition is concluded. And the value in being promoted, we've already spoken mm -hmm. about. Um, Peppermint Creative Bakes in Durban. She she shared with us that she just needed that awareness for a few sales to come in, wow. and it was just uplifting as an entrepreneur yeah. to get that going. That, you and know? that recognition that yes. hey, you met the criteria and you're on board with yes. a nationally renowned company that is Rush Gold. One hundred percent. We've come to the end of the show. Your closing remarks to our viewers this morning. I'd just like to say, if you are an entrepreneur that fits the criteria we've just shared, uh, if you know of someone who is a dynamic leader in your community, this is the opportunity that just may take you to the next level in your business. We always complain we have a shortage of opportunities. Here's an amazing opportunity, and we've profiled people who have benefited. Log on to our website, www.ybaa.co.za. Nominate yourself or nominate the other business you have faith in and you really want to win these prizes, and the rest is history. Join okay. us on this and journey. Okay, and it's not only about the prizes. It's no. just about being networking and being yes. with like-minded people and taking you up to the next level. Yes. Safia, thank you so very much for being here. Thank I'm you, sorry sir. that the interview was so short, but we had so much to cram in. <laughs> but I look forward to seeing you next Please. week where you're going to really unpack Certainly. everything for us. Yeah. So thank you once again. My Your pleasure. closing remarks to our viewers. I think I'd encourage everyone, like Shakira said, to participate, especially if you're looking for that motivation and a world of inspiring thought leaders, really. Oh, wonderful. I look forward to meeting up with you guys again, inshallah. And salamu alaikum to you. Thank and there you have it. YBAA Awards coming around early in the new year, but there's still time. If you believe 
you've got what it takes, please go to the Roshkol website, enter your small business, and who knows, the whole world could be your oyster. Don't go away, we'll be talking art in a little while. This is the part where we talk about um, sublime or subliminity because it's all about art. And I think sometimes we don't appreciate what the inspiration, the silence, the beauty, the subliminity that art can bring into your life. And of course, art is subjective. People interpret, interpret a piece of art differently and whatever it means to you and for you, embrace it. So on this part of the show we're going to be talking about art and amazing people having got together and created a space for artists in the Lanasia area and you don't have to be living in that area to get your artwork exhibited. This exhibition happened on the 6th of October and we are talking to the chairperson of the Lens Art Expo and a committee member, Asma Mullah. The chairperson is a legendary cricket commentator and I'm wondering why he's moved into the art field, but he's here to tell us about <laughs> it. And let's be all embracing and encouraging of the artists in our community community. Assalamu alaikum Aslam Kota and Asma Mullah. Welcome to the show. Salam. Thank you very much. Salam. For having us. Lovely to have you guys here. Yeah, I think you guys are doing amazing work in promoting art in the community. But Aslam, quite a, a, a different platform to be on cricket commentating and I know that you come from a cricket lo cricketing loving family yeah. and here you now in the space yeah. of art. Where and how did this become a feature in your life? Well, I'll say first of all that cricket is an art form on its own. Okay? <laughs> okay. I'm, not gonna, I'm not going to degrade uh, something that's so close and so, um, so oh, passionate about. Oh, I didn't about. expect you to do that. <laughs> okay. No, very simple. I mean, um, um, in my family, my younger brother, my late brother, uh, well, two of them, my younger brother, who's still with us, and my late brother, all had artistic talents from wow. a very young age. And as time had gone on, my one cousin, Rafik, who has been on your show before, of course, the, the calligrapher. Of course, the yes. Yeah. And, all, and, and Asma and her daughter were all doing things uh, basically for themselves. So the only people that knew about what they do is close family and friends, maybe. And it was time to actually give them some exposure. So I just latched onto the idea that, listen, we need to do something like this. And in 2014, we hosted one, very small one in Indonesia, 10 exhibitors, 150 people through the doors. And we knew that we were onto something then. It's taken a little while. And I must say that social media helped us in now forming uh, or hosting this last one. And it was an unprecedented success beyond our, our comprehension. And we were happy to give, as you said, those artists who are generally hidden talent an exposure at last. You know, they saw daylight for, for their work saw daylight for the first time. And it was only the second exhibition that you guys yes. have put on. You are the Lens Art Expo. How did you form this committee? And who, apart from Asma, who else is involved? Well, I, my brother and then Rafik himself. Mm -hmm. And then we needed to get some experts into the whole uh, uh, swing of things as well. So my niece and my daughter are very, very good with social media and also as graphic artists. So wow. we needed all of that expertise to put this whole thing together. So it almost, it's like a, a family thing. But of course, we will talk about this where we are now looking to formalize it and uh, getting a committee going and uh, making it uh, sort of more structured uh, in, in the years to come. Asma, your role, I know you're an artist in your own right. Um, are you excited about the Lens Art Expo and how big do you think it's going to grow? It was extremely exciting to be a part of the build-up of it, but also um, just to see the talent that we have within our community. I know that I myself needed, I, growing up, I was never artistic at all. I felt I was the academic one in the community, in, in my family. And um, I decided to just take a chance on a, a class. And that's how I got involved. And then I got my daughter involved. And I began to realize how important it is to give our children an outlet for, for, for the talent that they have within them. But also just a bit of um, downtime, you know, away from the hustle and bustle of studying, working. 
get your mind free and, and, and just let whatever is within you out onto paper, whether it's calligraphy, whether it's um, creating a, a piece of art. That's how I got involved. Um, Asim and I are related, so oh, okay. that's so how it's a family we, affair. Yeah, we knew yeah. that the talent was there. When you talk art, I mean, it's not only about some painting on a canvas. Art can be anything, any form of expression that's close to your heart. So you guys have just come out of an exhibition. How successful was it and what sort of diverse modes of art was displayed at the exhibition? I would say it was incredibly successful. We had 24 different artists um, showcasing their work. Um, and that ranged from your calligraphers. We had acrylic um, artists, you know, people doing landscapes, portraits. We've got um, a gentleman that was working with pin and thread in creating beautiful functional art wow. pieces. Um, we had uh, a lady that does dot art, so it's creating. That's an old Aboriginal form of art, um, which you use, um, you create patterns using different sizes of dots and colors. Absolutely wonderful range of artists that we had. And most of them were within the Linasia community. But say, having said that, we had people coming from as far away as Heidelberg and Rustenburg to come in and exhibit as well. And um, to show the amount of talent that we actually have and the, the interest that was there, we had to turn away almost, what, 15 odd people, just artists. prior mm -hmm. artists okay. that wished to exhibit and we just didn't have the space for them. So tell us about the actual day. Was there an entrance fee involved? And for the artists themselves, did they manage to sell some of their work at the exhibition, Asla? Yeah, look, first of all, we decided that we need to open it to, the, to all and sundry. So young and old, so a family of five or ten were coming there. If we put a price on it, we probably wouldn't have five or ten of them coming in there. So it was completely free. And we went uh, very, very, uh, how can I say, we were very modest with our, our charges as to, for, for the exhibitors. So it was 250 rand to be part of something which was... So that was the artists to the enter, the exhibitors, that to pay, yeah. 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 Okay. And that was just generally to just hire the facility and all of the that. The table and yeah. whatever else goes And they were given free reign to, to, to sell their artwork and that was the whole thing because I must tell you that we had a number of them, they spoke to Asma, they spoke to my daughter and uh, from time to time to myself as well that we're very nervous, we're not too sure uh, oh. how we're going to go about doing this, we've never done it before and all I said is that <clears throat> Let your art do the talking. <laughs> you just watch the people's reactions right. and you take it from there. And I must say, by the time we got to halfway into the day and towards the end of it, they were absolutely thrilled because they saw the reaction that each of their art pieces uh, got out of the people that came through. So from that point of view, it was, it was uh, our objective to get the people out there, to have them have their work exposed. And having achieved all of that, the excitement that uh, it has all created is they can't wait. In fact, some of them said, why don't we have this twice a year? Why it's just not? Too, it's, why not? It is a logistical mm -hmm. nightmare. I must say that <laughs> we... we, we Lots of work. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. and we all volunteers, you know, right. so we all have full-time work to do. And uh, also what we've realized is that, is that uh, with all of the graphic work that needs to be done, we'd pay about 30 or 40,000 rand for the work that we had done by my daughter and my niece. So for them to have put in that amount of time, Asma's a business lady, so is my brother and, and, and Rafiq and the rest of them. So it was quite uh, uh, demanding. And um, I must say, we've probably had about 70% of the exhibitors that said they want it twice a year. Wow. So we will formalize and then decide, And but I can tell you that we're going to be going bigger in the coming year. Now, the next question, you're probably going to uh you know, shy away from it simply because you've told me already that there's a lot of logistics involved. Are you planning perhaps at taking the exhibition countrywide or perhaps even to the smaller towns, etc.? Mm -hmm. And I know it does involve a lot of work. All right. Uh, I, I think you very well and your viewers on ITAV are, uh, uh, they know Alcaf, the uh, foundation quite well oh, and also uh, Zainul Kaji and he supported the organization supported the the event they in fact came to us to say we want to be involved because it's uh, it's culturally uh, significant and uh, one of the advices he did give us was to look to formalize and then take it to other 
uh, venues as well, uh, other regions. And I did tell him that I think it's going to be very difficult because let's just say if we're looking at uh, an area in Durban, then they need to focus on their artists who are also all hidden talents and perhaps having their things sitting in their own homes. So it needs to have a, a wider footprint, but I think it needs to go, uh, people individually in those areas need to look after it because it's just, it's, it could be something that no one will be job, able to handle. It's a full-time job, more than a full-time job. Yes. Asma, um, what sort of feedback were you getting from the artists? The artists absolutely loved it. You know, I'm sure you'd agree that um, putting a piece of um, artwork that you have produced on display is like putting a piece of yourself on display. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, it's coming from the heart. So it's it was very traumatic for some of them, and uh, but the, the response that we've got is overwhelming. Mm -hmm. We actually ran some workshops as well within the, the expo, so people were able to experience some of the, the art techniques that, um, the, that they saw the pieces on display. So that also was, was very well supported. And, I think and it's not really about, look, that's a bonus, selling the artwork. If somebody wants to buy a piece of artwork, <coughs> that's really a bonus for you. But it's really about other people coming and appreciating your artwork, your self-expression. Right. And I'm sure and I hope that the artists um, took all of that in. They did. They did. Um, and um, there's a lot of networking going on within the artist uh, community that we, we, we put together there. Um, if you listen just outside the conversation that's taking place, it's, you know, techniques, sharing of the techniques, sharing of supplier information, things like that, which is a, a wonderful bonus. I mean, Absolutely. we weren't even expecting that. Right. Okay, we're going to invite some of the artists that you've brought along. We'll go for an ad break. And when we get back, we'll have the artists talking about their particular techniques, as you've just pointed out, and showcase one or two of their pieces. Wonderful. Thank you so much. There you have it, the Lens Art Expo. I'm so sorry I've missed out. I didn't realize it was happening when it happened, but hopefully we can catch it uh, the next time around. And we're going to hold Aslam um, to account to make sure that he informs us about all of this timelessly, and we'll also make sure that you are aware of it. Don't go away. The artists will be joining us in a minute or two. Welcome back. My next guest has an absolutely fascinating, almost rags to riches story. He says in 1988, I think somewhere thereabouts, he came to Johannesburg and started work, these are his words, as a garden boy. And today he sits here in front of me, an internationally renowned artist. And his type of artwork is called pin thread sculpture and he has such an amazing story to share with us truly an inspiring person and truly the type of people we want to expose our young people to his name is Arden Ndab Indaba and he was exhibiting at the Lens Art Expo mm -hmm. and is also here to talk about his story and his passion for his type of art Arden morning welcome to the program good morning and thank you very much for accepting me in your Building. Did you think way back then when you came to Johannesburg as a garden boy because you had no other skills I had no that other this skills. is where you're going to be sitting showing off your amazing art and also exhibit it in Germany and other parts of the world? Yeah, I've never thought of that actually to be honest to be with you. I just came to Joburg to see you. Who's this Johannesburg gold? Egoli. Egoli and where everybody is getting <laughs> money and everything. And I never knew that life in Joburg, Johannesburg is more difficult than any other uh, place. It's very, it's very hard. Very, very hard. So yes, you came okay. here, you started out doing gardening. Yes, I was doing how, gardening. How yes. did your life progress and mm. how is it that you find yourself sitting here mm. and also working at one of the big top? trade unions in the country? Uh, it, it's actually uh, all about passion and about the commitment, you know, and about the hard work. Hard work is the, the key at the end of the day of exactly what you need to do. Because when I came to Joburg, I didn't even finish my grade 12, my standard 10. Standard 10, they used yes. to call it that way. I had to correspond it for four years because I didn't have the funds and I had to do it through a, a private institution for me to finish my standard 10. And so yeah, here you are that many years later and you've got the most amazing 
artworks on display here. You have jewelry, you have wall hangings, um, and so much more, which unfortunately we're unable to display speed, simply because of, of speed, space yeah. constriction. Uh, how did you get started with this and what's unique about this type of art? Yeah, what, what is unique about this type of art is uh, there's quite few different uh, techniques of whereby I'm basically using the practical side of geometry. Uh, normally geometry tells us when places of the same height and places of the same distances. However, in this scenario of the earrings, I'm using what they call clock system. How we thread the earrings around the symmetrical point of the springs, you use your 12 o'clock to your 6 o'clock, your 9 o'clock. Because geometry, you do everything on a straight line and the design will come on itself. You also taught at the Oprah Winfrey Academy. Yes, How I long taught. did you do that and what were you teaching there? Yeah, I was teaching at Oprah Winfrey for about like six months. I was teaching all the, the children about the basic of thread sculpturing, of where does it come from. Uh, I was basically doing what they call uh, uh, geometrical figures, which is the twisting style, the arc pyramid threading technique, the, the, uh, the touch. There's, there's quite a few of the different kind of techniques that you use that when you look at the picture, it actually embraces the beauty of the thread. Where and how did you learn this art form? Uh -huh. And what made you believe that this is something that's going to appeal to the masses and possibly uh -huh. you'd also be able to make a living out of it. I uh -huh. know you do it for the love and the passion of, it, the passion of it, but it, at yeah. some point uh -huh. um, you've got to fund the art that you, the pieces that you produce, yeah, that, that produce. and you need the money uh -huh. to buy more and more supplies. Yeah. yeah, how I learned about the art is that actually there was a, a, as I was a garden boy, I was given a wheelbarrow to go throw away the books. So instead of taking the wheelbarrow, I went to throw it at my place. And I, you mean the books, you took the books home? I took the books home instead of the dumping place. So as I was going through the books, making myself a small uh, brief uh, shelf, I came across this book that they call the string art, the beginner string art. And this is where I actually sat down and started cutting some boxes, trying to know what kind of nails I must use, what kind of a designs, how do you come up with the whole designs. Then I went through to the Johannesburg Library to get more information about the string art. From the string art, I realized that the books doesn't give me enough what I want. I went into the encyclopedias, uh, whereby to learn more about the geometry side of it. So this was all self-taught. You this went all self -taught, personally yes. to the libraries yeah. to research to all research of this stuff. All the, all the and stuff. this yes, is okay. the gorgeous products That's of correct, yes. um, your research. Yes. How long did it take you to master the techniques? Um, that's why I started, I started learning this, I think about 1993, and I was uh, from 2000, I opened a business fully on the 2006. A business of selling this type of yes, jewelry I, I and art? Yes, I registered the business in 2006 of, the, of my Aaron's pen thread sculpture. And uh, from there, I thought I knew more, but I was not. Until now, 2010, with the World Cup, I had like almost like um, uh, 18 places where I was selling around the world, around the South Africa, for all the people that came for the World Cup. And this is where I really realized that this can be a business. So since then, how has your business grown? And along the way, what has the challenges been? Uh, the business has grown quite symmetrical. And uh, what happens, the challenges, unfortunately, is the copies of the people that are doing out there, trying to copy what you are doing. And at the end of the day, your focus of trying to make sure that actually what you are doing does not de derive you from what people are trying to copy. Because at the end of the day... And unfortunately, it doesn't matter what area of business you're in, you're whether in, it's food, whether it's, it's food, clothing, it's whether it's jewelry, okay. whether it's mm -hmm. art. Mm -hmm. um, there are lots of like-minded like people minded. out in the world yeah, and they're ones. going to copy you because copy. they're going to think, well, I have that talent yeah. as well. Yeah. He's making a good business. Why can't, why I? can't I? But for you, it's more than that. It's more than a business. It's mm -hmm. the passion as it's well. It's the passion as well, yeah. Because everybody that actually tried to copy me, they failed. Why they failed, the only thing that you get, um, I don't want to mention any other <laughs> things, bad things out, yeah, out there, but what happens is that you as a small business, you start your own thing, but sometimes you get squashed before you even take the first step on the ladder. Why do you do that? Because now people will now, because of what you know, they will come, they will want to explore, they will want to get your stuff with small money and they will want to make more money out there. 
So it is a, a very difficult world out there, mostly when it comes to the small businesses. So you started this business it's still running, it's still but you've running, gone yes. back into the formal sector simply because mm. it's not sustainable enough. Enough, enough. Yes, um, okay. And sadly, that's the story mm. of that's a lot of artists. Of artists yes, they put okay. their hearts and souls mm. into their artwork, yeah, yes, um, okay. and sometimes it just does not pay back. Not because it's not good enough, mm. but because people may not be interested people may not understand the art, or people don't have the money, the money. to buy the art, the because money. art is seen as a luxury. As a luxury but yes. that doesn't mean that we don't stop appreciating it. Mm. You exhibited at the Lens Art Expo. What was the response like? The response was amazing. I was welcomed like I was part of the family. Everybody came to me to try to find out exactly how actually the art is done. I wish I would have done more maybe trying to bring something to practically show them how to come up with the whole idea of a string art. Well, not to worry. I think that uh, early next year, hopefully, Aslam Kota has suggested okay. mm. that they're going to try and have two exhibits per exhibits year. Per year. Yes, okay. That being said, are you planning on, I know you were at the Oprah Academy for six mm. months, for six months yes, are you okay. wanting to share this art form mm. with the rest of the world by way of opening up a teaching school? Yeah. I would definitely do that and I would, it would be it's actually my passion to say that actually I need to make people aware of what is a, doesn't mean because it's a string, it's a chip. Because this is a string whereby you use what they call the triple jacaranda thread. The triple jacaranda thread is as strong as your fish line. It can cut wow. you, it can strangle you, it can, it's as hard as that. Right. And sometimes people will think, no, because it's a string, you know, uh, it, it has to be done something. There's a lot. It's a, it's a, and how long will it last? This is this is it as well, isn't it? This is it. Yes, this right. is the practical side so of I'm, geometry. So I'm feeling as well. it, and it feels it feels a bit um, soft and soft, almost yes, fluid. Okay. Fluid. It yes, looks okay. gorgeous. It's very gorgeous, soft yes, on the okay. eye. But if I bought this uh, yeah. piece of artwork, mm. how long will it last me? In you know over a space of time, will it not mm. look drab and? Mm tired and yeah, okay. old. Yeah, um, uh, what happens is that because of the wood that we are using, I'm using a super wood of whereby I use panel pens, 13 millimeter panel pens of whereby everything has to get stuck on the board. Mm -hmm. It cannot, it will never pull out. Uh, each and every nail will be representing the, the double twisting of the thread around the nail with its small heads of whereby unless then somebody comes and cut it off, then you've got a challenge. But something like this, I can give you 20 years. 20 years. And how long would something like this take you to complete something and what like, would I pay for it? You would pay like 1,800 for a piece like this. It will take me about five days. Wow. And you would do, if someone comes to you to commission a piece of work, whether mm. it's mm. Um, Arabic, Arabic uh, yeah. writing, writing right. or whatever it is, whatever you, it could, is. you could, would be able, to, be produce able something. to produce something like that. Yes, oh, that's okay. wonderful. Well, Challenges, yes. Ch apart yeah. from the slump in the economy, yeah, okay. because economy. this is all luxury all items. Luxury items yes, apart okay. from that, what else do you see as a channel, challenge? Yeah, yeah. The, the challenge is actually to get the uh, people appreciate of what I do. Uh, of whereby if anybody comes and they say, I used to do this at school, I used to do this at school. Now, I don't want to turn back to the customer because the customer is a key. You have to smile back at them, even though they will be keeping on throwing things at you. The other thing is actually also trying to, the challenges is trying to grow a business into a real sustainable, to make more profit, to create more jobs, and to make sure that actually uh, the threat sculpturing is appreciated out there. You spoke about jacaranda thread. Three ply thread. Jacaranda thread, yes. Does it actually come from uh, the jacaranda tree? Yes, it comes from the jacaranda tree, and mostly it's also the thread of whereby it's not woolly. Uh, it doesn't hold dust, it doesn't, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a thread that doesn't, it's not woolly at all, yes. Okay. Brilliant. Um, yes, very quickly, in a minute to wrap up time, what else do you want to tell us about the jewellery that you have yeah, okay. actually produced here? Yeah. I'm producing actually the jewellery and all the jewelries are done on nickel free. Nickel free doesn't give any ear rushes. Uh, we, uh, we're using the, the ovals, the teardrops, we're using the chokers, uh, of whereby it's a combination of colours. Um, and they're gorgeous, and absolutely they're gorgeous. gorgeous. Yes, okay. I have no yeah. doubt that you've sold lots of these and you'll I be selling so. lots more in the future. And uh, do hope that you get commissioned for lots of big pieces of artwork. Thank you. Thank you for much. coming in and Thank sharing you your story with us. And yeah. 
Lots of luck for the future. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for your invites again. Much My appreciated. My pleasure entirely. Thank that you. was Aaron Ndaba. He's Ndaba, I beg your pardon. Aaron Ndaba. He's a pin thread artist, and he's just displayed his gorgeous work here. And also a big thank you to Aslam Kota and the Lens Art Expo. It's allowed people like Aaron to be showcased to the wider community. Welcome back, two down and two more to go. Artists is what I'm talking about. We now have uh, Viba Jeevan, who specializes in something called dot art. And a little later on, Yusuf Karolia is going to join us, showcasing his artwork as well. And you can see the amazing display here in studio. Uh, it's the first time I've been exposed to this. I think I might have seen a bit of dot artwork in the past, but never knew what it was all about. My guest, Viva Jeevan, Jeevan, is a dentist by profession. Her passion is for dot art. Morning, welcome to the program. Morning, Auntie Julie. <laughs> I'm fascinated. I do know that dentists mm -hmm. have to have the most skillful hands mm -hmm. to be able to do the intricate dental work on, you know, uh, in our mouths. Spaces are so small, yes. but you've got to be so good at what you do so that we can have amazing smiles like you have. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it's quite, uh, it's, 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 it's quite uh, the opposite of the spectrum, is it not? Being a dentist and then going into dot art. Well, actually, um, someone at the Lens Art Expo asked me, what do I do as my profession? And I told them I'm a dentist. And they said, but that's not a very artistic, uh, you know, occupation. Oh, no, no. And I, said, I no, disagree. Actually, yes. I said, actually, you, the patients just don't see the artwork we create. They may feel it and it may feel comfortable, but they don't see it. Or so uncomfortable. Th <laughs> yes. So this is the one way where I can actually take my dental skills, apply it to some art and create beautiful pieces with the same precision and accuracy and also get lots of satisfaction and joy yes. out of it so you've been practicing as a dentist for the past 17 odd years yes. how long have you been doing this amazing artwork that's been beautifully displayed here in the studio well I went for a very basic class last year in July and um, I just went more out of curiosity and I had a few religious pieces in mind you know we have our Rangoli during Diwali yes. I wanted to do that in dot art um, so that was my main intention. And when I went for the class, um, you know, the instructions were quite basic. It's fine. And then I just never touched a tool thereafter for the next two months because things were not, I, I, you know, they weren't, there wasn't time to do it. And then I started in September and it was actually something quite traumatic, which led me to start painting. And uh, I haven't stopped since. Oh, wow. Um, has the painting or the artwork helped you get over your trauma? Uh, it has. It, it, it fills a very big void um, and it just keeps me mindful of what I'm doing when I'm busy doing this. Everything else does not matter. Food doesn't matter. Time doesn't matter. Um, and you just want to do the best you can from yourself and put it onto canvas. And that's, that's I think, what just keeps me going. It's an expression of love, is it not? It is. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's like your soul talking to you. All right. So what exactly is dot art? Because you speak about, um, and I'm trying to feel it, and it's mm -hmm. very, it's almost like um, three dimensional. It's is it very not? textural yeah. um, and even the very full pieces, the, yeah. the landscape piece like we have here of the Kaaba, that is very textural as well. Mm -hmm. um, and even the other Islamic piece you have behind, behind you. Me. Um, and I've had a lot of people confuse it for beads. Mm -hmm. uh, but the thing is... Well, so, I'm trying uh, to yeah. figure out what it is. It's not paint, It's is paint. It? Oh, it's acrylic me. paint and it's applied with a dotting tools. So it's they're not actually specific to dot art. They One is actually a set of baking tools and what? one is a nail stylus. <laughs> the nail artists use in the salons um, and you can pretty much use anything you can use a needle you can use a pinhead you can use the back of a pencil uh, to create dots you can use anything that can create a good dot 
It's just that, um, you know, being technical, I actually look for tools for everything. So uh, the tools that I was exposed to, I've, I've used those for 90% of my work, but I've also bought other tools from other artists overseas and I've used those as well. Okay, how big is this dot art around the world? Mm -hmm. And let's look at value around mm -hmm. it. So if I commission you to do the Kaaba, for mm -hmm. example, Gee. but much bigger, probably as big as the screen, mm -hmm. Uh, what sort of value, what, what's the cost going to be like? Okay. And does this type of art increase in value, you know, like um, uh, like um, the other artworks, mm -hmm. the Renoirs, etc. Right. you know, over years? Um, I think the only time it would really increase in value is if I die. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> what would something like that cost? Well, I mean, how long size, would it take you to make? This one took me about... Um, took me about five days mm -hmm. it was about four hours every evening or more I don't really keep track of the time um, and funny thing is with this piece I was asked nine months ago to create it but um, I honestly believe a lot of the art that I do is just it's divinely timed it's you will get to do it when God wills it Absolutely. and a piece like this I actually said this to someone the other day I think that God wanted me to only do it the day I had sufficient skills to do justice to it. Brilliant, and it is gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous. Um, costing? Costing, this one you're looking at about between two and 3,000 Rand for a, this is a four. As it gets bigger, we normally work out the size of the piece we're looking at, as well as how how much dotting goes into it. Right. If it's a very intricate pattern, if it's uh, semi-dotted versus fully dotted. Like if we're leaving negative space, like in, right. in that piece there, that would be slightly less, But it, and it also depends on my expertise. The fact that I feel um, my art is of a, of a good quality now, it's not like beginner level, um, you have a right to charge a bit more. Absolutely. Um, and the fact that we can do it faster now, because I've had more experience doesn't mean it should be cheaper because you, you pay for the experience. And you're not mass producing. No, it's it's one of a kind. Absolutely. Um, so let's, how do you actually do it? Do you kind of trace it on the board first um, to get it absolutely accurately? It depends. This one I was given a picture, um, actually a drawing, and uh, I just worked from there. Uh, very often, like the uh, Arabic calligraphy, I, I know nothing about Arabic calligraphy. I've had to teach myself, and I've had to give it the utmost respect. All religious pieces I do get absolutely. the utmost respect. Mm -hmm. um, so those I've had to trace and transfer onto the surface I want to use. Uh, but I've also had other people who do calligraphy if you just double check me and tell me it's correct. Brilliant. Um, yeah. How big is this art form around the world? Uh, As I've said, it's yes. the first time I hear of it. No, it's huge overseas in the US, the UK, in um, Australia, because the lady who actually started what uh, she coined dotalism uh, is a lady named Elspeth McLean. And she was an artist and she just decided one day to take her passion further and started doing dots with paintbrush. She still produces beautiful work. Um, and then it's just become a bit of a trend. So it's very trending right now. Um, but like all other hobbies and art forms it will reach a saturation point where people will either lose interest or continue uh, um, it's just the ones who continue or make who it last. grow in a different direction exactly you've also got apart from pieces that you can hang up on the wall mm -hmm. you have what you call very functional pieces yes and what looks to me like jewelry as well so tell us about those pieces okay so the jewelry pieces what I've actually done with that is um, very often if you look at other dot artists, you'll notice that they have um, stones, decorative stones that are dotted, and uh, they sell those, or you can use it as a paperweight or a door stopper. Uh, but decorative is usually, it's so beautiful, you don't even want to put it as a door stopper. <laughs> so uh, what I decided was I wanted to create things that have function, because I didn't want you to just buy a piece of art. Okay, this is a different piece of art, but any other piece of art, you don't really have to have a taste for it and you don't have to hang it up on a wall. It can be something you use in your daily life. So the um, uh, jewelry actually was inspired by an Oscar Wilde uh, quote that I came across, which said, you either are a work of art or you wear a work of art. Oh, so wow. I found that wearable art is like really amazing because it's a piece that's unique to you. But I've done it as a collab with a lady who runs um, a little business called Twisted and Stoned. And she does the wiring of the pendants for me. Wonderful. I create the stone 
and I okay. paint it and she wires it. But I've done a lot of other things as well, like the phone pops, like, um, uh, you know, just things you can use. I've done incense stands, all made from scratch. And I use my dental knowledge and dental materials to actually do those. I see you have lots of Hindu religious pieces mm -hmm. as well. Yes. How popular is that amongst your community? Well, if you think about it, a lot of the art that we are exposed to that is on sale at the moment usually comes from India and it's usually mass produced. So if you're looking for a piece that complements your home and that is unique in every way, um, or better still was commissioned and made specifically for you and for your home and your taste, then the dot art pieces are very popular because um, it's something that, it's, it's textural, it's, fun, it's, it's a focal point in your home, it's something that no one else is gonna have. Even if I make identical copies of it, it will never be identical. It's like that saying same, same, but different. Absolutely. Yeah. Longevity as far as these art pieces are concerned? They are all sealed with um, sealer. It's uh, usually UV resistant, so you can hang it up in your home. We usually advise not to have it where direct sunlight is hitting it. Um, also, some of it is resin sealed, like some of our stones are resin sealed. Uh, those are waterproof. Uh, you know, those can last uh, a very long time. But usually, I mean, if you just treat it with the correct respect and you frame it nicely, uh, it should last you you die or I die. <laughs> okay. Uh, you obviously also exhibited at the Lens Art Expo. Yes, I did. What was the response like? It was the first time I ever exhibited on my own with my pieces. I had exhibited previously at the Wits has um, Expo just for medical people. And uh, they actually stopped having it recently. But that was a totally different art form that I did that time. It was 3D decoupage. Uh, so this was an, an event in my life. It was just really overwhelming. But it was very exciting. And there was so much appreciation and love from the people who came. They were just amazed. Um, a lot of them, like I said earlier, thought it's, it's it's jewelry or it's beading. Yes. Uh, they couldn't believe it's just paint and it's just dots. And um, and there's true precision <laughs> that goes into that, isn't it? Well, I just a patient of mine actually just sent me a review last night to tell me that um, I'm a left brain artist. Why? Because so? I use my analytical mind to Aha, do the art. Okay. Okay. Uh, and she said it was very touching uh, because she actually said you 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 disprove the theory of being a left brained artist. There you go. Congrats on that. Thank you. Did you manage to sell a couple of pieces? Um, yes, I actually sold a few pieces. I got a few commissions for the day. I, I sold actually the first clock I'd ever made. Mm -hmm. um, so I was quite happy with that because I was going to give it away on Facebook or Instagram anyway. Um, and um, I just got good exposure. I sold a few of the kits that I sell as well, which has like a whole lot of dotting tools and instructions and in that as well. Uh, and I've used all my university knowledge to create instructions for dot art. So who knew Wits Postgrad would get you to creating <laughs> instructions? Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Um, expos like mm -hmm. the Lens Art mm -hmm. Expo, how important is it in our communities and for people mm -hmm. like yourself? Well, the good thing about bringing it out there to the public is that it's something that we make real to the people who feel that it's for a certain niche market. It's for everybody. And the thing is that you don't know which little child could get inspired and do something that would be amazing one day and just put lens on the map. You know, um, I mean, I was born and bred in Lens, <laughs> so um, uh, it, it, it's something we have to encourage because gone are the days where our parents told us you had to be doctors or lawyers or, um, you know, accountants. Uh, those aren't the professions that are actually, you know, in demand right now. We'll always be in demand for our medical, uh, you know, practices. Expertise, but sure. the thing is that people need to know that there are other things in this world that you can do. And this is purely a form of expression. And very often, if you think about um, art therapy, when people need to, uh, like an abused child, and you need the child to speak to you and tell you what's happening, the best way is to get them to draw or color. And you can tell a lot about the colors people use based on their mood or their, their feelings or whatever is happening within them. Yeah. So why not translate that to something that you can actually hang up, be proud of, and say, you know, I actually created that. And creation is something we, we gifted if we can create. And Absolutely. we all have it in us. Mm -hmm. So we just need to find it, embrace it, and own it. What about giving classes and 
exposing children to this art form? Um, Are they I, able to do it? Uh, I do give classes. The youngest I've had has been about nine years old. I usually just spend a little bit more time with the children, actually mark off where they should place the dots. Uh, but surprisingly, the kids actually do a better job than some of the adults really? <laughs> because they listen. And the adults come with preconceived ideas that I know. So uh, the children don't know. They just work from curiosity. And that's how you should be. And that's why when people ask me, but you call yourself an artist? I'm like, no, I'm not that famous. And I prefer calling myself an enthusiast because I am enthusiastic about every single piece that I do. Um, in this modern age, um, things kind of go through phases. Mm -hmm. You have trends of things and sometimes things like, I hope that mm -hmm. this lives forever, but <laughs> if the phase kind of um, dies out, right. What do you think would be your next um, art form or expression of um, art? Um, I don't know. It will come to me. It will come to me. <laughs> I, I, there's very little I can't do uh, in terms of if you teach me a skill Expe or you show me something, I will be able to do it. Wonderful. Uh, but um, I hope it never comes to an end for me because it's really given me a lot of peace and a lot of calm and a lot of quiet, um, which my husband really appreciates. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> because I talk a lot. <laughs> and that's where we'll have to leave it. Thank you indeed for sharing beauty with us oh, on welcome. the show this morning. And I have no doubt lots of people are going to get in touch with you. Do you have a website address? Uh, I have a Facebook and Instagram page. Which is? Uh, it's called Sun, S-U-N, and Dotter, D-O-T-T-E-R. Good on you. Thank you for sharing You're with welcome. us. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. My pleasure entirely. Thank you. And our final interview will be with Yusuf Karolia. And let's see what he brings to the table this morning in terms of art and beauty. And finally, a contemporary abstract artist is in studio with us. His name is Yusuf Karolia, and he says he happened upon art just by chance. He's a number cruncher in real life. He'll tell us a little bit about that. And then his passion and his love for art. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to the program. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Jazakallah for having me. Great to have yes. you here. And thank you for displaying your gorgeous art pieces in studio so today. Um, you happened on art by accident. Tell us the story. Uh, so I got married about two years back. And after rearranging the house after a year or so, um, I had an open wall, uh, quite a large wall, I would say five meters by about three meters. And obviously you would like to fill, fill that space in the house. And I planned on looking around for an art piece and a thought came across as to why I shouldn't plan one myself, see what I can put down on canvas. And that is how it all started, where I took an idea, I put it on canvas, alhamdulillah, it came out really amazing. What made it, you think that you could, um you know, you had this artistic streak in you and you'd be able to produce something that is pleasing to the eye. It all started <laughs> uh, back in, in, in primary school. Uh, it so happened that I found myself drawing whenever I had the time or uh -huh. perhaps not paying attention to the teacher and drawing on a piece of paper. Uh, and many of my friends in school found out that I could draw. And what they used to do is come to me and ask me to perhaps draw a cover page for their book. Okay. And I used to sell that to them perhaps for a rand or two rand to support my tax shop edition <laughs> or whatever it is. Okay, um, wonderful. But as you move on primary mm. school into high school, you sort of uh, move away from that. Reason being is because you are now more focused on where your life needs to be headed. And I realized that it's some, the creativity is something that was in me and it's something that I can use to escape the real world. And yet, despite the creativity, you've gone on to become an economist and? Uh, yes, uh, I have a degree in economics and econometrics and work for an asset management company. Number crunching all of the time. So this is an absolutely wonder wonderful way for you to de-stress de and give expression to to beauty, to emotions, to all of the things that are dying to come out of you. Yes, yes. Like I said, it's, it's, it's a stressful world. And as soon as you come home and you hit the can, uh, canvas, it's, you leave everything behind. And After you did that painting for your own, for the wall in your house, 
Um, and I know that you exhibited at yes. the Lens Art Expo. Sure. Was that your first uh, uh, formal exhibition? Hey. What was the response like? So the uh, Lens Art Expo uh, came across it on social media. And the reason I exhibited was f for the sole reason of exposure. I'm not too sure of how the market is. Uh, first time exposing myself to art in the market. And I just wanted to see what it would be like to be a part of their community. And alhamdulillah, it went very well. Uh, Meet around, up with your expectations. Uh, more than my expectations. Uh, I got to meet a lot of wonderful fellow artists and a lot of feedback and input from the community that has helped me to sort of think of art in a different light altogether as well. Prior to that, and now that you're turning out the most gorgeous pieces of art, here's one behind us, here's one in front of <laughs> us, and many more which unfortunately we couldn't display. Um, did you sell any of your pieces? Did you get commissioned? And also, did you go for any formalized um, training just so that you could get that extra edge? I think um, a lot of the times we tend to go to YouTube. <laughs> uh, but more than that, I think it's, it's a learning by way of doing. Okay. Um, so you will do something now that will uh, teach you something uh, that would enable you to do something better on your next painting and sort of how you apply your experience. Uh, but if you ever look, these are a little different from the frames that you would have in, in, in your homes. Uh, reason being is because, or oh, this is my thinking, where uh, our homes and their structures and the, their styles have changed quite a bit over the past decades or two decades. And we move sort of from a classic to a com contemporary and we need art to sort of complement those. Absolutely. So if you have a, if you have a look at your, your convent, okay, I would say for lack of a better word, conventional frames or paintings, uh, it would be calligraphy in a frame with a glass on top. Uh, if you have a look at this piece, it sort of takes your aspects from your home and translates it or put it all together into an art piece. So this art piece, for example, has a little bit of canvas, um, a little bit of wallpaper, and sort of that abstract look that complements the styles of the home nowadays. Okay. Uh, when people, have you had any commissions to do specific pieces of artwork? Yes, yeah, so I've exposed myself through uh, social media, uh, but I think my exposure, so you develop your, your Instagram and Facebook page, but uh, the Lens Art Expo really gave me that push in terms of exposing my, uh, exposing my pieces to, to the community. Alhamdulillah. And Alhamdulillah, we've had a lot of, uh, had a lot of followers and I've received a few orders, Alhamdulillah. Uh, I think now it's just a balance of uh, the full-time job and coming to come home. And Absolutely. Do you kind of think that sometime in the future, when you don't have to focus on money or putting bread on the table, that this is what you'd like to go into full-time? I've given it some thought. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, there's two reasons why I want to push to move in this direction. Uh, one of the reason I uh, reasons are is that to create an art piece uh, more specifically mm -hmm. to this, where you have an right. ayat of the Quran. Uh, if you have the intention of uh, building an art piece where if you're displaying it in a, in, in a home where the person who mm -hmm. reads it, you make an intention that whoever reads it, may the reward be passed on to the person and to you as well. Inshallah. So inshallah, that will be my way of securing my place in this world. And, inshallah, and the, the Akhira. Akhira. Challenges being in this field, um, I don't think our community, because of the dark days of apartheid, which suppressed us in very many different areas of our lives, we weren't exposed to art. How do we get that interest and thanks to Aslam Kota and the team to bring this, exp you know, this expo, which hopefully is going to run more regularly, to truly expose us to art. What are your thoughts going forward? Uh, I just want to point out Jazakallah to Aslam as well. I mean, he's where I was a few weeks ago and now where I am after the expo, Alhamdulillah. And I think it's uh, apart from, from having social media, it's word of mouth as well. Uh, you have a lot of family visiting each other and, for example, if I have this art piece in, in an individual's home and he has 
family come over for read whatever it is um, and if we have this art that may intrigue or interest people and have that or have them to yearn having one in their home. Absolutely. I think that's that's the way to get our art out there. Uh, great, and we look forward to future Lens future. Art Expos. How yeah. do you actually work out the costing of your art pieces? Because you haven't been exposed in a formal art environment, yes. um, and I know you probably take into account uh, the paints and the canvas and brushes, etc., that you use and the resins and so forth. Uh, but how do you put a value to a piece of artwork that you produce? Mm. It must be very difficult. Very tough. Uh, there's two aspects to costing. One would be uh, the material costs, uh, fixed costs. That obviously is very easy to calculate. Uh, the other would be the time that you you give up on what you could have done or spent with somebody else, for example, with the family, or the time you could have spent maybe working on something that could benefit uh, yourself other than financially uh, but I have sort of worked out a structure um, sort of around the the, the same f working hours or, or pay that I would receive for my full-time job and once you have those two elements together obviously you don't want to um, charge people an exorbitant price You've because got to make it affordable. We want to bring art into the lives of our community, yes, yes, but it's yes. got to be affordable. And I think that's the one thing um, that frightens people. I'm going to this exhibition, I need a few art pieces for my home, yes. but I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to afford it. Yes, yes, that's good. But I think time, time is most valuable. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you can sort of work that balance between how much you need to charge per your time, uh, for your time, uh, and also, if you charge a reasonable amount for your work, you do know it's, 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 it's a work of love from your part, absolute work of love. That is good. You're pouring your heart and soul into the art piece, and you know that if that's what you're doing and someone's going to hang the piece up in their, in their home or in their office, they're always going to look at that piece and get lots of satisfaction and lots of peace and harmony by admiring that piece of work. That is correct. And I think what would take me further than, uh, than the monetary value of selling a piece is uh, the doors that come Absolutely. along with it. Absolutely. So uh, I believe that uh, within our religion that uh, you shouldn't, uh, there shouldn't be any extortion or, or charging of an absorption. Fair play is the name correct. of the game. And Baraka comes from Allah. Absolutely. So, yes. Shukran so much for being with us. So nice meeting you and appreciating the gorgeous art that you've turned out. May you and all of the artists on the show this morning, including Aslam Kota and his Lens Art Expo Committee, grow from strength to strength. Amen, amen. We definitely want to see all of you grow and bring the love of art and appreciation of art to our entire community. Like, inshallah, Jazakallah for being with us. Jazakallah for having me. And that then brings us to the end of the show. Amazing, isn't it? All these amazing artists just pouring out their love on a piece of canvas or whatever materials they're using. Sincerely hope you've enjoyed the show and the beauty that was displayed here this morning on Let's Talk. Till the next time, as always, be safe on the roads. And it is Khoda Affairs from me, Julie Ali. <laughs> يا هلا يا هلا يا هلا يا هلا حن قلبي على جمعة الخير هلا حن قلبي على جمعة الخير هلا يا 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 هلا